Hello, lovely person. This is RPG Mods fan. Captain Courageous and I collaborated on doing a review of the legendary Dungeons & Dragons module S2 White Plume Mountain, which was written by Lawrence Schick. The review is broken up into two parts. Captain Courageous has done the first part, so I would recommend going to his YouTube channel and watching his video before watching this one. Link is in the description below. This video is the second part of the review and is appropriate for Dungeon Masters only. I am Corruptus and my thrall RPG Mods fan will be giving you a tour of my lovely dungeon. He will be discussing the module itself and this video will contain MAJOR SPOILERS. Unless you are a Dungeon Master who will be running this module for their players, or are a player who already played through this module and are watching this video for nostalgia purposes, I would suggest not to watch the rest of this video. You have been warned. I like the way the artist, Jason Thompson, describes the S2 module. He succinctly described it as a theme park dungeon with mud baths, saunas, aquariums, and a kayak ride. The MacGuffins of this module is for the player characters to retrieve three sentient weapon artifacts. The three weapon artifacts are well, a dwarven warhammer that basically is a hammer of stunning with the additional power to detect gold, gems, and goblins. Wave, a trident with various water powers and can dehydrate enemies on a nat 20 roll. And Black Razor, a soul-eating greatsword grants haste and immunity to charms and fear but is detrimental to the wielder versus undead. Here is a suggestion for the Dungeon Master to use when running the S2 module. Again, this is only a suggestion. Instead of having all three owners hire the player characters, only have one of them hire the party. This way you can have two other adventuring parties active in this adventure. One can serve as rivals, the other can serve as rescuers when direly needed, and can consist of replacement characters. Supposedly a wizard named Coraptus stole the three artifacts and challenges the owners to come and get them in his abode of White Plume Mountain. There is only one problem with that. Coraptus lived more than a millennia ago. Can this be the real Coraptus? Or an imposter? Well, that is up to the Dungeon Master to decide. Personally, I would make Coraptus a very powerful lich. This would explain a lot of potential problems with the module. Being a lich explains how Coraptus is still active during the player character's time. Being a very powerful lich explains how he is able to compel many monsters to be in his dungeon. After a millennium, the lich Coraptus got bored and lonely. Despite having many monsters for company in his dungeon, I would also make Coraptus an egotistical narcissist. Instead of what a normal and sane person would do to get attention, he instead steals three powerful artifacts from their powerful owners. Being an egotistical narcissist, Coraptus relishes seeing others suffer. The module starts with the player characters at the outskirt of White Plume Mountain. South of a great swamp, 
It stands alone in a vast area of dismal moors and tangled thickets. White's Plume Mountain is almost a perfectly conical volcanic hill. It rises about 800 feet or 244 meters above the surrounding land. After some searching, the player characters can find a small natural cave in the side of a hill about two miles from the plume, known as Dead Knoll's Eye Socket, which they can use as shelter and to rest. At its southern slope, the player characters will find a cave-like entrance known as the Wizard's Mouth. White's Plume Mountain is a volcano formed from ancient slow lava leakage with a system of old lava tubes. The white plume that gives the mountain its name and fame is a continuous geyser that sprouts from the very summit of the mountain. An underground stream runs through the mountain. When the water reaches the magma chamber, it is instantly converted to steam and ejected out of the volcano's blowhole, forming the continuous geyser that White's Plume Mountain is famed for. The three weapon artifacts are located in three different areas of the dungeon. Whelm is located in a dark room near the southeast corner of the map and is guarded by a vampire. Wave is located near the north end of the map and is guarded by a giant crab. Black Razor is located in a room near the southwest corner of the map and is guarded by an Ogre Magi or by an Oni. At the end of the Wizard's Mouth Cave is a rusty spiral staircase that descends about 100 feet or 30 meters. The player characters will feel a continuous low vibration that is noticeable everywhere in the dungeon. This vibration is from the plume's geyser. The dungeon of the module is full of monsters, puzzles, and wacky traps in more or less equal proportions. In other words, it is not a trap-heavy dungeon, nor is it a monster-heavy dungeon. The south-central region of the dungeon is flooded. The murky water with floating patches of green and white scum is a foot or 30 centimeters deep. The water can be drained by opening a valve at the bottom of a 10-foot or 3-meter pool at area number 9. A mangy and bedraggled gynosphinx squats in the middle of a three-way fork. Passage into the intersection is blocked off by a wall of force. The gynosphinx will ask a riddle to the party. If they answer correctly, she will lower the wall of force. If they answer incorrectly, they will have to resort to bringing down the wall and then fight the gynosphinx. In room number four, suspended from the ceiling are nine silvered glass globes. When the party has entered this room, the door will slam shut. Nothing can open it from either side, except for the key that is in the globe located in the south center of the room. The rest of the globes have false keys. A few have treasure, a few have false treasure, one has three shadows, Another has an air elemental. Lined up against the north wall of room number five are five flesh golems. Each has a number on its chest. Five, seven, nine, eleven, and thirteen. Number five says, One of us does not belong with the others. If you pick it out, it will serve you, and... 
the others will allow you passage. If you pick the wrong one, we will kill you. You have 60 seconds. The answer is 9, because 9 is not a prime number. As a funny side note, I reran the S2 module for some friends who already been through it. I kept the map the same, but changed around more than half of the rooms. In this room, I had the illusion of Jerry Ryan's Star Trek Voyager character, Seven of Nine, over all five golems, and kept everything else the same. My friends know that I love old Star Trek, and that I have a crush on the Seven of Nine character. So, after much... <laughs> I am still laughing at, at this. So, after much debate amongst themselves, they reluctantly, <laughs> they reluctantly answered seven. Then I had number seven reply. Seven is the incorrect answer. Nine was the correct answer. One of my player characters then blurted out, See, I told you he doesn't always think with his... Then the Jerry Ryan look-alike flesh golems attacked the party. Chamber number 7 is a natural large cavern. 50 feet or 15 meters below is a deep pool of boiling mud. There are two geysers here. The northernmost geyser will sprout once every five rounds. The southernmost geyser will sprout once every three rounds. From one end of the cavern to the other is a series of four foot or 1.2 meter diameter wooden discs suspended from the ceiling by massive steel chains. So the challenge here is to get across without being scorched by the steam erupting out of the geysers. Room number 8 is affected by a darkness spell. So when the player characters open the door, they will see utter blackness. The vampire Tenmir layers here. Under his coffin, in a niche in the floor, is the Warhammer Whelm, as well as the vampire's considerable treasure. Room number 10 appears to be a water-covered room. The danger here are two kelpies in the 15 foot or 5 meter deep pool within this room. Kelpies make their D&D debut in this module. Area number 11 is a 30 foot or 9 meter long oily cylinder shaped and spinning corridor. Watching through a hole in room number 12 is Burkett a fourth level fighter. If he sees intruders get halfway through the spinning cylinder, he will shoot a flaming arrow at it, igniting the oil. Burkett's lover, Snarla, is nearby. She is a seventh level mage, and she is also a werewolf. At area number 14 are a succession of three thick metal doors. These doors were meant to be emergency doors to prevent the dungeon from being flooded by the boiling lake in cavern number 15. The subterranean boiling lake is more than 100 meters deep, extending down to the red-hot rock below. The lake is fed by an underground stream and then runs off to area number 16. The runoff cascades down lava tubes to the base of the blowhole. There, the water strikes the magma, instantly converting it to steam and ejected out of the volcano's blowhole. The corridor from the dungeon continues onto a stony platform that ends in an oval-shaped platform into the boiling lake. The whole stony platform would have been submerged in the boiling lake if it not for a domed elastic 
transparent skin that keeps the water out. Here lives the guardian of a wave, a giant crab, the biggest anyone has ever seen. The water skin walls are susceptible to being punctured, cut, etc. So, violent spells such as fireball, lightning bolts, etc., mist range weapon attacks, etc., can easily puncture the water skin. Wave is inside a heavy chest along with other treasure at the north end of the oval platform. A series of undamageable and unremovable copper plates lines the walls of corridor number 19. They set up an induction field that causes metal objects passing through them to become heated to eventually superheated, which will burn through cloth. Eight ghouls are in secret room number 20, they lie in wait to ambush the party. In addition, the ghouls are wearing amulets that protect them from being turned. Near the ends of this wide and long hall are two 5 foot or 1.5 meter wide open pits. They are lined with rusty blades at their bottoms. The walls, floors, and ceilings of the open pits and the section of the hall between them is coated with a 100% totally frictionless substance. Even a heartbeat can cause a character to slip. The end of the hall is hidden by an illusionary wall, making the hall seem 10 foot shorter than what it really is. Fly, levitate, jump, dimension door, blink, and teleport spells will not work in this room. In room number 23, water not only flows through the room, it also floats. Flowing out of a hole from the north wall, half a meter off the floor, is a stream suspended in mid-air. The water is one meter deep. The brisk current then exits through a hole on the west wall. Also in the room are six kayaks, but no paddles. In room number 24, eight fighters under the command of Sir Bluto Sans Pites await here to net and ambush any who come through the floating brisk stream. There are secret doors which are labeled with the number 25 on the displayed map. These doors can only be opened by a special key that Sir Bluto has. Upon entering chamber number 26, the player characters will look out and down an enormous chamber defined by terraced steps that ring the entire area and descend toward a central enclosure. Basically, the room is an inverted ziggurat. At level with the door is a 10 foot or 3 meter wide walkway. The next tier down is a 3 meter wide and 3 meter deep pool of water enclosed on its sides by glass walls. In this aquarium are six giant crayfish. The next level down is a three meter wide sand covered tier with six giant scorpions. This terrarium is enclosed by its sides by glass walls. The next tier down is also an aquarium but has four sea lions instead. Three manticores pace about at the lowest tier. They will fire their spikes from their tails at intruders. The module states that their wings have been clipped, so they are unable to fly. In my game, in order to spice things up, as a DM, I return the manticore's ability to fly. Yes, I can be a cruel dungeon master. 
Chamber number 27 has lavish furnishings and decorations. There is a 6 foot or almost 2 meter tall hookah in the corner. Within the room is Kwasnef, a Orgra Magi, which is an Oni in D&D 5e. When the player characters enter, he will already be shape-changed to the form of a halfling. Black Racer, along with Kwesnef's valuables, will be hidden beneath a divan. Initially, Kwesnef is meant to be a role-playing encounter. Perhaps Kwesnef will invite the player characters for a smoke pointing towards the hookah. What transpires next? Well, that is up to the DM. And so ends the S2 White Plume Mountain module. Or does it? If the player characters should succeed in obtaining two or even three of the magical weapon artifacts and are finally leaving for good, they will be stopped at area number two by the return of the Wall of Force. A voice will speak to them out of the air. Not thinking of leaving, are you? You've been so very entertaining. I just couldn't think of letting you go, especially with those little collector's items of mine. And since you've eliminated all of their guardians, why, you'll simply have to stay to take their places. I'll have to ask you to leave all of your ridiculous weapons behind and let Nyx and Nox escort you to the indoctrination center. I'll be most disappointed if you cause me any trouble and Nyx and Nox have to eliminate you. Don't worry, you'll like it here. The Wall of Force disappears, but... Coming up the South Passage are two Eferiti named Nyx and Nox. If need be, this encounter can be made tougher by the addition of one or two more Eferiti named Box and Cox. If the party is defeated, they will be taken to the bottom of the pool in area number 9 where there is a concealed door that leads to Karaptis' indoctrination center. There they will be brainwashed and will end up as the new guards in the White's Plume Mountain dungeon. If the player characters manage to escape, their next task is to return the artifacts to their owners. If they instead decide to keep one or more of the weapons, needless to say their owners will be most displeased. Hence, this can be used as plot hooks for future adventures, such as the displeased owner hiring rival adventuring parties to retrieve the weapon. Roll credits? Displayed are the credits found within the module itself. Only one new monster makes its debut in this module, and that is a Kelpie. A Kelpie is a form of intelligent aquatic plant life that resembles a pile of wet seaweed. It is able to shape its body to various forms, often assuming the aspect of a beautiful humanoid in order to lure people into deep water. White's Plume Mountain is one of the best and one of my favorite Dungeons and Dragons modules. Well, the I-6 Ravenloft module is my favorite, and S2 White's Plume Mountain is my second favorite. It has the right balance of monsters, puzzles, and traps. With the exception of Black Razor, which I love anyway, it is filled with original and well-thought-out ideas, all of which makes it fun and memorable. Thank, Thank you, you for, for watching. watching. Hope, Hope this, this video, video has, has been, been informative, informative and, and entertaining. entertaining. 
I want to say thank you very much to Captain Courageous for collaborating with me on this review of the White's Plume Mountain module. Next week on both of our channels, we will release the full version of the review in one video. Till next, next time, time, this, this is, is RPG, RPG Mods, Mods fan saying, saying cheers, cheers, have a, have good, a good day, day and, and goodbye. goodbye.